Well, great. Uh, if you're a Christian, then you know that God provides us with the answers to life in his word, in the Bible, correct? He provides all the answers that we need to know. And sometimes, but sometimes we as Christians, sometimes we forget and we worry about all the injustices that are going on in the world today. We see the injustices going on in the news. We see it on YouTube. You see it everywhere. And it's unfortunate to see so many injustices and unfair things happen in this fallen world. But we know also that the answer on how we can stand strong can be found in God's word. And also, God tells us not only how to overcome these struggles and stay strong, but he also tells us how to live our lives without having to worry about these things. So please turn to me in Psalm 37, verses 1 through 7, and listen to what God's Word has to say. Now, if you didn't bring your Bibles, that's fine. Um, I have it put up on the PowerPoint up on front. But I'm going to read Psalm 37, verses 1 through 7, and please listen to what God's Word has to say. This is what Psalm 37, verse 1 through 7 says. It says, Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So let's dig into Psalm 37 and see what God is calling us to do. We can start out by reviewing point number one. And point number one is standing strong and overcoming difficult situations in an unfair world requires us to not worry and to trust in the Lord. Now, before I continue any further, I want to give you a little bit of background about Psalm 37. Psalm 37 was written by King David. God had inspired King David to write Psalm 37. And King David was Israel's most beloved human king. And as some of you know, David was not one to face a trouble-free life. If anything, he faced troubles that were beyond even maybe what we can imagine. For example, King David, for example, is, is, you know, we know him mostly by his battle with Goliath, right? And that didn't seem like fair at all, because remember, you had this lowly shepherd boy taking on this huge giant of a man who was nine feet, six inches tall, taller than any NBA player. So if you can imagine David going up against this guy, it seemed like it's overwhelmingly unfair to him. We also know a time where King King Saul, Israel's first human king, was so jealous of David's success that he chased him down and tried to kill him. There's also another time when two of David's own sons, Absalom and Adonijah, separately went against him and tried to usurp his authority as king. So we see all these things going on. And what we can break down from this is that during the times of King David, as well as during the times right now, people really haven't changed. Sure, our surroundings have changed, right? You know, you see uh, new buildings, and soon we're going to see a beautiful new NPR that's going to be painted. But we're going to see all these things around us that our surroundings change, but not people. There are still evil and wicked people. And this is because of a fallen world. Because remember, when God first created the world, the world was perfect. It was good. It was beautiful. It was paradise. But what happened? Adam, after Adam and Eve sinned against God, they rebelled against him, everything changed. And the world that, had, that God created out of love, the world has now rejected him, has turned against him. And now there's sin in our world, there's corruption, there's perversion and evil. So we see that in our world. We live in a fallen world, a world that is turned away from God, a world that's full of injustices. Injustices happen on a daily basis in our world. And this is what the Lord said. We too will face troubles just like King David. He said that in John chapter 16, verse 33. So how did David stand strong and overcome difficulties in a fallen, unfair world? Well, David succeeded by not worrying and trusting in the Lord. As a matter of fact, the very first verse, very first verse in, our, in my message today is Psalm 37, verse 1, which says, Fear, fret not, 
or don't worry. We don't usually use the word fret today, do we? We usually say don't worry. So don't worry is basically what don't fret means. But before I continue any further to the three main points, the, main th the three main things that God wants us to do in order to stand strong and overcome in an unfair world, there's one thing that God wants us to do before anything else. And what's that? Don't worry, right? Are you a worry wart? Do you worry about things? Oh, you know, I don't know if I'm looking good or I don't know if I'm doing this right. We stress out about those things. Are you a worry wart? Or maybe are you a stress monster? Someone's always like stressed out, right? Anything like that? And sometimes, you know, we let these things get the best of us, don't we? We worry, we get stressed out, so it's to be human. But the one thing that God had laid on King David's heart was, he tells, don't worry, don't worry. How many of you remember that song, Don't Worry, by Bobby McFerrin back in the 80s, I think it was, Don't Worry, Be Happy, right? I mean, <laughs> I thought that was a silly song, but I actually liked it, okay? Because when I hear those words, don't worry, it brings a calmness to my heart. And when it comes from God, it really brings a calmness to my heart. So my question to you is, do you ever get frustrated or angry or worry when you see evil people and mean people succeed and pass up seemingly good people? Do you ever have that? You know, maybe you saw an elderly person get assaulted for no reason and only to have that person get away with it. Or maybe you saw, see some evil leaders in our world today who are enjoying a lavish life of eating as much as they want, and yet their people are starving. Or perhaps maybe, you know, you just see things that just don't seem right, and it seems like evil people go wrong. Well, that happens, and that is because we live in a fallen world. But I think before we continue any further, what exactly is worry? Well, worry is when we don't trust in God, and we become fearful. I think we've all done that before. I know I have. I've done that many times. But it's when I don't have enough trust in God. As in fact, Pastor Francis Chan once said, worry implies that we don't trust that God is big enough, powerful enough, or loving enough to take care of what's happening in our lives. And you know, Jesus talked about this too. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 27. This is what Jesus said. He says, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Isn't that true what Jesus said, what he said? You know, worrying does absolutely no good. It's fine. Worry robs us of the joy and energies of today and really could paralyze us. So there's really absolutely nothing to gain from worry. As a fact, in a non-faith-based study done in, 19, in 2019 by Penn State, by, France, by Lucas Frenier and, Lewis, and Michelle G. Newman, they found that in their study that 91.4% of the things that we worry about never happen. Most of the things we worry about never happen. And most of the things, and the things that did happen that we worried about weren't as bad as we thought they were going to be. We worry over the simplest things. And when King David wrote Psalm 37, he recognized that people back in his day worry again, just like people today do. But David didn't stop there. He said, we shouldn't worry because evil people will quickly fade away like the grass. Isn't that what he said? In Psalm 37, verse 2, it says, for like the grass, you will soon weather, like green plants, they will soon die away. Isn't that true? Like right now, how many of you, is your grass dying right now because of the drought? <laughs> it is, right? I mean, a month ago, my grass was green. And I was kind of proud of it because it was nice and, you know, dark green. But now it's kind of fading. And it's only been a month. But that's how quick evil people will fade away because God is in control and he won't allow that to happen forever. You know, evil people eventually fade away, but we will live forever with Christ in heaven because God is just and he will bring justice to those who are evil. You know, the Apostle Paul recognized this when he said in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, he says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. In other words, what he's saying is that the troubles that we come across in life, they're only temporary. They're not gonna last forever. But what we learn from it when we turn to him builds in us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. So what happens is that God is working in us. When we go through problems or difficult situations in life, that's an opportunity for God 
to change us and to mold us and really to help make us to become more like him. You know, even though we may not seem to be, we may not seem to be victorious in the short term, the reality is that these troubles, these trials will not last for long. And God encourages us to put our trust in him and do what he says. What else are we supposed to do? What does King David say? He says in Psalm 37, verse 3, he says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. What does all that mean? Well, it means that, remember, everything that God tells us to do is good, right? We should be helping the poor. We should be helping the homeless. We should be doing all these things. Most importantly, share the gospel to a lost and fallen world, to, a bunch, to people who don't even know him. We need to do those good things because God calls us to do it. And don't worry about what all these evil people are doing. It doesn't matter because all what we should be cared about, what we should, what we should care about is doing what God wants us to do, and that is to do good. You know, trusting is believing in the promises of God in all circumstances, even those where the evidence seems to be contrary. Now, oftentimes we sometimes wrestle with, we, we as Christians, sometimes we, we wrestle with, well, how much are we supposed to trust God? Well, we're supposed to trust God with all our heart. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. You see, humanly speaking, sometimes we only want to trust God with a little part of our lives, right? And then we want everything else done our way. But what I find at me getting older is that the more I trust in God, the easier it gets in a way. Not easier in terms of, of, of dealing with these trials, but letting God be in control. And then God allows our faith to grow. The more we trust in him, the more we surrender to him, the more we submit to him. You see, by trusting the Lord, it means that we allow God to be in control. Let him be in control, not us. It, trust in the Lord is the opposite of worry. But look at what Psalm 37 verse 3 also says we are to do. We are to, like I said, do good and just not worry. And just do what God says. That's all we have to worry about, to do what he says. Keep our hearts and our minds focused on God. We are to love and take care of each other and share the gospel. Now, the second thing that God calls us to do is we need to delight ourselves in the Lord, which is point number two. Point number two is standing strong and overcoming difficult situations in an unfair world requires us to not worry and to delight ourselves in the Lord. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So what exactly does that all, all that mean? Taking delight in the Lord means that our hearts truly find peace and fulfillment in him. You know, if you put, try to put fulfillment or peace in anything else, it's not going to last. But our God does not change. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says that our Lord doesn't change. And if he doesn't change, neither will his promises. Everything else was only temporary. Our God is eternal. God has given us a hope and a future with him in heaven that we don't deserve. So what, so what we need to do is when we take our delight in the Lord, our delight should not be based on our circumstances around us, because those change, but our light, delight should be in the Lord, knowing that he is in control and, again, has our best interests in mind. He does this because he loves us. And, again, God always keeps his promises. Psalm 145, verse 13. You know, a synonym for delight is to rejoice, to be joyful or joy. And in James chapter 1, verse 2, the apostle James said, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. So why would the apostle James tell us to consider it pure joy whenever we face different trials? Well, because our trials, our tribulations, and our difficult times can teach us to depend and trust God even more. Well-known Christian writer and author Tim Keller, a man who almost lost his career and family, once said, I always knew that Jesus is all I need to get through, but you don't really know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have, and then you find out that he is enough. Isn't that true? The Apostle Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. He says, for my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. This is so true. And when you turn to God during the most difficult times, when you've exhausted all your strength, and you turn to him in prayer, he helps you through it, 
and your faith in him increases, and his peace replaces your fears and your worries. God allows us to experience these problems so we can turn to him and trust him even more. You know, it's all based on a relationship with God. It's all based on a relationship. And you've heard this before too. It's not about religion, what we do. It's what we, who we believe on, who we have that relationship with. You know, Peter, an apostle, the apostle Peter and martyr of the Christian's faith, this is what he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 67. He says, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while while you have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Peter saw this too. He was so absolutely convinced of this that he was willing to die to give his life for the Lord Jesus Christ. So what the Lord wants us to do is to undertake any and all tasks with him, not to do it by ourselves, but to do it with him. So when we take delight, joy, and rejoice in the Lord, he will give us what we want, the desires of our heart, which is to draw closer to him, to depend on him more, and to become more like him. And when we learn to trust in him, take delight or join him, we learn to commit our ways to him. Which leads to the last point in today's message. Point number three is standing strong and overcoming difficult situations in an unfair world requires us to not worry, and to commit our ways to the Lord. Psalm 37, verse 5 to 6 says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. To commit ourselves means to pledge, to promise, or to bind, to, to make a certain course or policy. In other words, Commitment is to take some kind of action in order to fulfill a promise or a pledge. In the examples, it's like marriage. A faithful husband is loyal to his wife, and he demonstrates his love for her by being loyal to her. A faithful husband's commitment to his wife is demonstrated when he says his vows at the time when he is getting married, and then he's carrying out his pledges promised thereafterward. That's where the commitment part is. So my question to you is, are you committed to the Lord like so many sports fans out there or any kind of enthusiast? You ever see like sports fans out there? Boy, they really get into it, right? You know, they got a hat that has their favorite baseball team or football team and they wear the shirt on there and maybe they have a tattoo or something that has their favorite sports team on there. You know, we see these things and you have to wonder, you know, they're called fans because the word fan is short for fanatic. But if we see people so fanatical about their sports, or their passions, are we as Christians fanatical for our Lord in the same way? Concerned that the Lord has done so much for us. One of the songs we sang earlier was about his love, how it's so amazingly awesome. And, and, and it's like, do we give, return that same love to him? Because he's given us so much. He has given us so much. But this is what the Lord will do when we do what he says and we're committed to him. Psalm 37, verse 67 says that he will, that, that God will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn and your vindication like the noonday sun when you're committed to him. God will reward your commitment to him so bright that people will know that you're right and they were wrong. You know, he will quit you. He will exonerate you. How many times has someone falsely accused you of doing something wrong and then all of a sudden, you just, all you care about, you don't care about revenge. You just want people to know that you were right, that you did the right thing. But if God is our witness, what more could we ask for? The king of all creation, to let, to know that he's the one who's standing up for us and that he trusts us and that we did what he called us to do. There is no greater joy in letting him be our witness, also knowing that we did what he called us to do. And the last part is this, Part of committing ourselves to the Lord requires us to wait on him according to his time and not ours. This was Psalm 37, verse 7 says. It says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. So how many of you like to wait, right? <laughs> not too many of us do. Right? We live in a world where if you go to Amazon, you get your package maybe like in a day or two go to fast food restaurant. I was just at Burger King yesterday. You know, and it's like, you just want to go in and get your food right away, right? 
But, you know, we live in a very fast-paced world. Fast food, fast deliveries, fast cars, fast lives. But learning how to wait is God's way of teaching us to be patient. And patience is really one of the fruit of the Spirit, right? That in Galatians 5.22, to wait according not to our time, but waiting according to God's time. And this is what James chapter 5, verse 7 through 8 says. It says, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. You know, patience is so important. You know, our Lord, he waited 30 years before he started his ministry, right? He waited 30 years. Jesus never ran, he walked. And in the Old Testament, King David waited 22 years before he became Israel's most beloved king. And Abraham himself waited 25 years before his promised heir came. We really need to slow down, calm down, and pray. Wait on God's timing and not our own. And in closing, I just want to share a story with you about a woman to whom I... It's an amazing story. Born on September 21st, 1925 in Haleybury College in Hertfordshire, England, Helen Rosevere didn't become a Christian until she was a medical student at Newnham College, Cambridge, in 1945. Upon accepting Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, Helen joined the Cambridge Intercollegiate Christian Union and regularly attended prayer meetings, Bible study classes, and evangelical events. After completing her studies, Helen became a medical missionary. And in 1953, she went to the Congo, where she was assigned to the northeast provinces of the country. In the Congo, Helen built a combination hospital training center and in, early 19, in the early 1950s, then relocated to Nobu Bongo, living in, the, in an old leprosy camp where she built another hospital. In 1958, Helen returned to England, but felt a calling to return to the Congo. Two years in 1960, Helen returned to the Congo. And during the Simba Rebellion in 1964, Helen was taken prisoner by rebel forces. And she remained a prisoner for five long, grueling months, enduring several beatings and rapes. After Helen was mercilessly beaten, raped, and held captive for five months, she left the Congo and headed back to England after her release. During her times of captivity, where the evil, ruthless rebels mistreated her, Helen asked herself, is it worth it? As Helen pondered whether the cost of following Jesus was worth it, she sensed God was speaking to her. Several years later, during an interview after about her horrible experiences in the Congo, Helen told the interviewer, when the awful moments came during the rebellion, the price seemed too high to pay. The Lord seemed to, to ask me, change the question. It's not, is it worth it? It's, am I worthy? She concluded that in spite of the pain she had endured, always the answer is yes, he is worthy. Helen didn't stop serving the Lord despite being mistreated by evil captors. In 1966, Helen returned to the Congo to assist in the rebuilding of the nation. She helped establish a new medical hospital and a new school after the old ones had been destroyed, and she served there until 1973. After returning to England, Helen started a worldwide ministry, speaking and writing, and continued to serve the Lord faithfully up until the age of 92. And on December 7, 2016, Helen went to be with the Lord after faithfully committing her life, trusting him, delighting in him, and committing her life to him. Through God's grace at work within her during her horrible experiences in the Congo, Helen Roosevelt served or decided that the Savior who had suffered even death for her was worthy to be followed no matter what she faced. You know, I myself over the years have learned you know, to look at every problem, every trouble, every challenge as an adventure to be with God where I can see and experience not only his presence in my, in my life, but also his power, his wisdom, and his love. And remember John chapter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, which says, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. We can and we will overcome whatever challenges come our ways if you turn to the Lord because he is in us. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, the apostle Paul said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We could do anything that God calls us to do if we turn to him, if we trust in him, and we have live our lives for him. When we learn to stand strong 
and to trust and not worry, he would do things for us that we never could have imagined. And in conclusion, I just want to recap what I talked about. Standing strong and overcoming difficult situations in the unfair world requires us to not worry and to trust in the Lord. Standing strong and overcoming difficult situations in an unfair world requires us to not worry and to delight ourselves in the Lord. And three, standing strong and overcoming difficult situations in an unfair world requires us to not worry and to commit our ways to the Lord. And the main point that I really have to share in today's message is this. Standing strong and overcoming difficult situations in a fallen and unfair world is dependent on your relationship with the Lord. You see, the more you trust and take joy and are committed to him, the more peace, strength, and faith you will have in him. So as we go about this next week, I'd like you to think about these questions, some life application questions. The first life application, life application question is, when you are treated unfairly and unjustly, how do you usually respond? Do you try to handle the situation on your own? Does it stop you from doing the thing, good things out there? Or do you turn to yourself and seek revenge? How do you respond to that? And number two is, now that you know how God wants you to respond whenever you are treated unfairly or unjustly, we turn to him by not worrying, by trusting in him, by delighting in him, and committing your life to him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much, Lord, for your son Jesus, who's the perfect example of how we are to deal with unfair, unjust situations in our life, Lord. Father, he was the perfect example of how we are to act. And thank you also for the brothers and sisters before us who also went through horrible situations, and yet they persevered because of their obedience to you and trusting in you and delighting in you and committing their lives to you. So, Father, as we go about this next week, help us to turn to you even more. Help us to remember it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship with you. And Father, may our lives give you the glory that you and you alone deserve. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.